folks, welcome. Video discussing work applications of integrals. In this video, we'll talk about work as it relates to force over a distance. So this is the physics understanding of work. We'll talk about it in terms of a non-constant force, a constant force, and also incorporate some specific types of forces. By definition, a constant force F is used to move a, when a constant force F is used to move an object over a distance D, the work done is work equals force times distance. You can think about the work as the amount of effort required to, to perform a task. Um, a quick units check, we'll use two different units in this section on work, unit systems in this section on work. Uh, we use metric units in which force is given by Newtons. Distance is given by meters, and work is in the units of a newton meter as a joule. Similarly, in, in imperial units, a force is given by um, some amount of pounds, a distance is given by feet, and the work is a foot pound. So pounds times feet is a foot pound. Um, just keep in mind that, that imperial units, pounds gives us a force. So a couple examples illustrating both of these unit systems. Here's a question, how much work is done in lifting a 200 kilogram rock to a height of three meters? So you see here uh, having a 200 kilogram, kilogram rock, we actually have a mass that we need to convert to a force due to the acceleration of gravity. So we see that the force due to the acceleration of gravity acting on this rock is 1960 newtons. So in order to overcome that force, we need to use a force of 1960 newtons over three meters, which gives us work. In this case, that work is uh, the force, the constant force we use, 1960 newtons over a distance of three meters, so 5,880 joules. Now, similarly, we'll talk about the work done when a 300 pound, 360 pound gorilla climbs to a height of 20 feet. And in this case, there's no extra calculation to do because in imperial units, 360 pounds is the force that we'll use. So again, 360 pounds over the height of 20 feet, 7,200 foot pounds. More generally, we're going to be interested in computing work done when the force applied is non-constant. So in order to do this, we'll assume that an object is moved along the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b using some force f of x. So our strategy here is going to be to assume that the force on that kth subinterval is constant, even if it's not, f sub k which is going to be given by f of x sub k. In that case, the work on that kth subinterval, say from x sub k minus 1 to x sub k, is going to be the force over the distance. And if we think about dividing the interval from a to b into n subintervals of equal width delta x, that work is exactly f of x sub k delta x. So here's that calculation exactly as we described it. If we move from x sub k minus 1 to x sub k, that's a distance delta x using a force f of x sub k, approximating that to be that variable force to be constant over the subinterval. Then the work on that kth subinterval is w sub k is approximately f of x sub k delta x. Use a sum to add up all these little bits of work. Let n go to infinity. The sum becomes exact. So we see again the parallel with what we've been doing since the beginning of our area discussion, approximating a quantity with the Riemann sum. In this case, the sum k equals one to n of f of x sub k delta x, making that approximation exact by letting n go to infinity. In this case, we obtain the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So that will give us the work when we have a non-constant force. Here's an example. Suppose that we use a force of x squared plus 2x pounds to move an object from x equals 0 to x equals 3 feet. Find the work done. So we have an expression for force 
we have the x limit 0 and 3, and the work accordingly is exactly a definite interval. In this case, that work is the integral from 0 to 3 of x squared plus 2x dx, so 1 third x cubed plus x squared evaluated between 0 and 3. Top limit, subtract off the bottom limit, obtain 18 foot-pounds. Okay, so we'll go ahead and talk about a couple specific types of force. Those two specific types of force we'll talk about are uh, overcoming or doing work to move a spring, in particular to move a linear spring, in which case we'll use Hooke's Law, and the force to pump a fluid from some tank. So we'll start off with Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law states that the force required to hold a spring a distance x from its resting length is proportional to that distance. So this is a model, and in this model, we have that the force is proportional to a quantity. This gives us that f of x is equal to kx, where k is some constant of proportionality or spring constant. So this is the form we'll use for the non-constant force in spring forces. I want to point out here that um, x is the distance the spring is stretched or compressed from its natural or resting length. So you can imagine if you were to set a spring on a table, there would be some length of that spring. Um, we're identifying that resting length as x equals 0. And, and if you stretch it or compress your spring, um, that's the distance x from that natural length. Okay, here's an example. A force of 10 pounds is required to hold a spring stretched four inches beyond its natural length. How much work is done in stretching it from its natural length to six inches beyond its natural length? Uh, first things first here, we'll have to go ahead and think in feet in terms of feet instead of in terms of inches. Of course, four inches is one third of a foot, six inches is one half a foot, and we're told that 10 pounds is required to stretch a spring four inches beyond its natural length. This gives us a spring constant, and that spring constant is k equals 30 pounds per foot. Now we'll go ahead and use that value of k in answering this question of how much work is done to stretch the spring from its natural length, or x equals zero, to six inches beyond its natural length, or x equals one half. In this case, we see that the work is the integral from zero to one half of kx dx. Power rule for antiderivatives, fundamental theorem of calculus. The work is k over eight foot pounds. Now, of course, in this case, k is 30, and that gives us the value uh, of the work of 15 fourths foot pounds. So um, 15 over 4 foot-pounds. Last example is to compute the work required to pump a fluid with, say, some mass density of K of rho kilograms per cubic meter out of a tank. Um, and, and in this case, the work is done overcoming the force due to the acceleration of gravity. And slightly different approach here, in this case, we'll think about slicing our tank at a constant depth and approximating the work moved and in, in moving that particular slice of, of fluid. Then we'll go ahead and, and add up all the different slices, end up with a Riemann sum, and let n go to infinity to find the integral. Here's an example. A tank is an inverted cone with height 10 meters and radius 4 meters. The tank is filled to a height of 8 meters. Let's find the work to pump all the fluid to the top of the, of the tank. And we'll just assume that the acceleration of gravity is g meters per second squared. OK, so here's our cone, radius 4 meters, height 10 meters, water, or fluid in this case, filled to a height of 8 meters. We want to pump all of that fluid to the top of the tank. So we will set up a frame of reference here. We'll set our frame of reference to be some height 
from the bottom of the tank, call it y, and then think about taking a slice at that height y and pumping things up to the top of the tank. So here's our slice at height y from the bottom of the tank, which I'll identify with y equals 0. Now, as it turns out, you can set y equals 0 wherever you want to. You just have to be consistent with where you set y equals 0. Again, here for ease, I'll go ahead and set y equals 0 at the bottom. Now, we're taking a slice with thickness dy or delta y. In this case, I'll write it as delta y. And thinking about the work it takes to overcome the force of gravity in moving that slice of water to the top of the tank. So just like the rock that we moved to a certain height before, we'll end up computing the force we'll use to move that approximately constant, um, uh, approximately constant force is equal to um, the mass of, of that chunk of water times the acceleration of gravity. Of course, we get the mass by multiplying rho times the volume, and we get the volume by looking at the volume of the disk. So at the end of the day, the force there is pi times rho times r sub i squared, r sub i squared delta y times g. Now here we've got a delta y in our, in our formula that tells us that we need to figure out r in terms of delta y. Well, luckily, there's a special triangle that's going to help us do that. So here's a triangle that relates the height and the radius of the cone to the height and radius of the slice we've taken here at height y sub i. So that relationship, of course, is r sub i equals 2 fifths y sub i, which allows us to put our force f sub i in terms of y sub i as pi times rho times g. I've just sort of organized all of these constants out front times the quantity 2 fifths y sub i squared delta y. Now, of course, we have to move that a particular distance. And the distance that we have to move that is a distance of 10 minus the height of the slice y sub i. So at long last, we have an expression for the work to move that ith slice of water at height y sub i. And that expression is pi rho g times 2 fifths y sub i quantity squared times 10 minus y sub i times delta y. I'll go ahead and rewrite that again here in just a second. So again, here's that work w sub i to move the ith slice of water. I've reorganized the constants one more time to write it as 4 25ths pi rho g times y sub i squared times 10 minus y sub i delta y. Now what we'll do here is add up all of these little bits of work over the interval uh, that covers the water. So here's that Riemann sum approximation of the total amount of work. As n goes to infinity, the number of slices that we've taken goes to infinity. The y sub i's become y's, the delta y becomes dy, the sum becomes an integral, and in this case, that integral is, again, over the limits that we're interested in y, right? So we've sliced things from our starting point at the bottom of the tank, y equals zero, all the way to the top of the water, which is at y equals eight. So those values are the limits of integration from y equals zero to y equals eight. And you can sort of see the two competing forces here, namely that when y is larger, you have a larger amount of water that you have to move a smaller distance. When y is smaller, we have a smaller amount of water that we have to move a larger distance. And again, here I'm saying water, I really mean just some arbitrary fluid. So in any case, this is the definite integral that tells us the work involved in draining this tank. I won't go through the computation of the definite integral in all of its gory detail, but you just get out a number, and that number ends up being the following. That number ends up being 8192 over 75 times pi rho g joules. Of course, the unit here of work in the standard units is, is joules. OK, folks, hope you have enjoyed this video on work 
Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.